folks. Welcome back to Dune Brew. Today, we're working on a pretty cool project and a pretty fun one at that. It's building a box mantle or a beam mantle for above a fireplace. Or really, you could put it on any wall for that matter. This, of course, is all part of our kitchen renovation, uh, which includes the fireplace that I built, which is actually a three-sided fireplace. This mantle is the double return, meaning it turns around the corner on this end and around the corner on the side on the right. On the other side, the fireplace butts into the wall, so I'm building another box mantle, which I'm calling a single return. Now, when it's all said and done, I'm hoping the overall effect will look as though these two large beams are set into the fireplace structure with a stone work around it. At least that's the look I'm going for. This is not a difficult project to knock out, but like so many other projects, the results are pretty striking and really add a lot of character and warmth to your house. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now let's run through a quick plan review and cut list. Now I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly, and these are all my measurements, and they may differ from what measurements you have to do for your project. For me on this double return, the most important dimension is that middle dimension of 51 and 7 eighths. Now I'm gonna be building two mirror images, a top and a bottom, and then they'll be joined with the facing that goes on the front, which forms the structure of the box mantle. Now, those red lines there indicate all the spots where on your facing board, you need to do a 45 degree miter cut. Gives it a nice clean finish as you look at it from around the room. And again, these circles indicate your miter cuts. Now it's important to note the thickness of your board because that's going to determine the overall length of your facing pieces. Those uh, pieces on the small wings there, the returns, they only have a miter on one corner, so three quarters of an inch, but anywhere else where you have two miters, you need to add an additional one and a half inches to the overall dimension of your facing board. Now we're coming up on our cut list here, and what you're gonna need is a top and a bottom piece, the horizontal pieces, two of those. You'll need four three inch wide pieces for your returns, one long piece for your main facing piece, two for the short sides of the returns, and two for the long sides of the facing return. Now it's important to note for a box mantle, you really only need two widths of boards. For my project, five and a quarter and six inches. So when you make your cuts, set up your saw for each of those cuts and make all identical cuts to width at one time. And now it's time to head off to the hardwood shop. I really enjoy this part of the project. Just going to the wood shop and taking a look at their inventory and all the beautiful different types of woods that are available. For this project, I'm gonna choose cherry because that's gonna match our kitchen cabinets. And as you'll see in the finishing process, I'm going to the Java stain that'll get pretty close to the color of our kitchen cabinets. And the first step is cutting all of our boards down to five and a quarter or six inches in width. And then for all of our top and bottom pieces, we'll cut them all to their finished lengths with a straight miter cut. And that's a total of two large pieces for the top and four small pieces for the returns. Now here I'm marking for the final cut on my top and bottom pieces, 51 and 7 eighths plus six inches, the dimensions of the returns for an overall length of 57 and 7 eighths. We got to spend. Yeah. Here I'm cutting up for my three inch by five and a quarter inch return pieces. I need four of those. And what I'm gonna do is set up to cut two at a time, and those will be the pieces that uh, are matched up top and bottom. That way this ensures that they're exactly the same length. Just a 
Okay, now I'm going to set up to join the return boards to my main top and bottom pieces. Now, in days past, I might have used a biscuit joiner and a, and a biscuit with glue and clamp pressure to join these two pieces of wood. Now, I'm going to try my pocket hole jig. This is the first project that I've actually tried to use the pocket hole jig, and quite honestly, it worked out really, really well. If you haven't seen my pocket hole jig unboxing and how-to, you may want to check out that video as well. This is really a great way to edge join two pieces of wood. And you can do this for, of course, the box mantle project, or you could do it for tabletops as well. In days gone by, you would have to join the boards with glue and clamp pressure. And some folks would also include a biscuit or a dowel to help strengthen that joint. Now I'm using a tight bond hide glue here and that's specifically formulated for areas that might be subjected to a little bit of high temperature. Not any kind of screaming heat, but just a little bit more than usual. And since this is going above a gas fireplace, I figured better be safe than sorry. So I'll clean up my glue squeeze out, and I'll go ahead and use the appropriate screw for hardwoods, which is a coarser thread screw. And I'll ease that pocket hole screw in there, and that joint is secure. And now our second return is secure as well. And of course I made two of these for the top and bottom. Next it's time to select the wood for our facing. This of course is all personal preference whether you're looking for something with a tight grain or a little bit of figuring to the grain or maybe even some knots for a more rustic look. I chose a board that's kind of in between. A little bit of interesting figuring plus a couple of very small knots just to give it a little bit of character. But again, it's all personal preference, but it's an important selection because this is the most visible part of your mantle. Now, the first cut to make is a 45 degree miter. And those scrap pieces are going into the burn box to add a little bit of smoke to some steaks I'm making tonight. Okay, now I've flipped the facing board end for end and Carrie's giving me a hand holding that tape on the inside of the miter to ensure that I get the proper cut at 51 and 7 eighths for my inside dimension for the second miter cut. And next we'll cut out the four remaining facing pieces and we'll listen to Jonathan Jones's Stone Blues while I do that. Okay, complete with our cuts. Back into the house to do a quick dry fit. Everything looked pretty nicely, and we're going to apply our glue, line up our miters, and secure it with a couple of nails.
And that completes the build of our facing. Next, we'll break out the top and bottom pieces, apply our glue, and I've got our clamp set up. Even though I'll be using pocket joinery for this as well, I have our clamp set up just to ensure things are aligned the way I want them and stay where I put it while I secure the screws. And I'll repeat the process for attaching the top of the mantle. And it's going to take a little bit of coaxing with a hammer. Not too much, but it's nice to have a real nice tight fit with no gaps at all. Now it's back out to the shop to do quite a bit of sanding. And as you can see, I'm holding my belt sander to about 45 degrees to the grain of the wood. That's just a little bit of a trick to more aggressively remove the material, keep things nice and level, and then turn the belt sander parallel or in the same direction as the grain and finish out that sanding. Now obviously the belt sander is a much more aggressive sanding tool and I'll switch over to my random orbit palm sander and I'll start off with 60 grit then I'll move to 80 100 and then I'll finish off with 150 grit the gel stain that I'm using recommends not going any higher than 150 grit sandpaper now the reason why is because at grits higher than 150 180 220 etc you're going to start polishing the wood more than you are really sanding it and in that polishing process with those higher grits you'll kind of close the pores of the wood which will make it a little bit more difficult for the stain to penetrate the wood and give you a nice rich deep color. Okay now I'm fitting my router with a 1 8 inch roundover bit. That's going to provide just enough roundover to ease that edge but not be too obvious and that's kind of what I'm going for. I'm not going to distress this down any, and I don't want any real aggressive roundover. I just want to knock that edge off in a uniform fashion. And I just beat the rain. Now I'm going to countersink all of the nails with a nail punch, and then I'll use a good quality wood filler. I like DAP plastic wood. It's, it's made with wood fibers. It, it reacts like wood, uh, and it takes a stain like wood. And this one is specifically formulated for darker woods. Now once all the wood filler is dried up, which really only takes about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, back outside for that final finished sanding with 150 grit sandpaper. And we're almost ready for the finishing shot. Okay, one final step in our sanding process, and that's to go over all the edges with a sanding sponge. I like using a sanding sponge because it really helps to ease those edges, makes them look real natural, and helps to remove any mechanical uh, sanding marks left by the palm sander. Okay, now as I mentioned, I'll be using a gel stain, and I really like general finishes stains. And I'll be going with a Java stain to closely match our kitchen cabinets. This stain goes on real nicely, in the per the directions you want to put on a generous amount and let it set for just a couple of minutes and then wipe it off with a clean rag. So let's see how that works out.
and wow I was really excited when I was removing the stain that is just beautiful and the look I was going for that's real close to our kitchen cabinets and I know that uh, a few coats of a satin polyurethane is really going to make that uh, look wonderful. Okay, now it's about time for the polyurethane process. Now what you see here already has three very light coats of polyurethane applied. I like doing three real light coats, sanding in between, and then a good sanding before I put two final coats on. You see a little bit of bubbling there, but don't worry about that. That happens with natural wood or, or any kind of a wood product where a little bit of air escapes from the pores. We'll get that out in the sanding process. Now the directions on the can recommend a 220 grit. I like to go a little bit higher than that with a 320 grit sandpaper which I'll wrap around an old sanding sponge and then give the whole piece a good once over with that 320 grit sandpaper. Now you'll see where those bubbles were. They come into view here for just a moment. I can still feel them with my finger and then I'll completely sand those away and they disappear. And Quite honestly, when I first started refinishing or finishing furniture uh, 25 plus years ago, I got real nervous at this stage because, gosh, I'm, I'm sanding what looks like a beautiful finish. Uh, but don't have any reluctance to follow those instructions and give it a good sanding uh, because once you reapply that polyurethane, that shine just comes right back and it looks wonderful, even better than before you sanded it. Now real quick, uh, I'm using Polycrylic by Minwax. It's a new water-based polyurethane, which I'd never used before, but gosh, it did a great job. And because it's water-based, the cleanup is super easy. So real happy with the way this went on and the overall finish it provided on my box mantle. Now, as you apply the polyurethane with a good quality foam brush, uh, you're going to get it on your, your piece, but then you want to finish out with real nice, soft, long strokes in the direction of the grain of the wood. And that way you'll get a, a seamless look to your finish. the mantle I'm just going to use a piece of stud lumber a two by two and I ran this through the table saw to get a nice square flat edge on the part of the board that meets up against the wall where the mantle will be mounted what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some liquid nails to the back of the uh, mounting strip and then we'll put it on the wall and then mount the mantle to that let's go ahead and put the liquid nails on Okay, my next step is to drill four holes for the screws to go through the mantle to mount to the mounting strip. I'm going to use a countersink bit, which is a, a pretty nice bit that drills the pilot hole and countersinks 
into the mantle so the head of the screw sits below the level of the mantle. That way the stone will sit flush on the mantle. A little bit of liquid nails, we'll put that mantle in place. And it just fits like a glove. I'm, I'm real happy with the way it fits. And looking at the stonework underneath, uh, it sits real nice and flush up against that. And the mantle itself is real nice and level. But that's what you'd expect, because we took the time to ensure the mounting strip was perfectly level. I do have a little bit of what I would call fore and aft leveling to do. The right side is pretty close, needs a little bit of tweaking, but the left side is just a little further out. It's about a full bubble at a level with the leading edge falling down. So we'll get that into place first, get it nice and level, and then secure it with a screw. Now that end's not going anywhere. And now back on the right side, just a wee bit out of level, We'll knock that into place, secure it with a screw, and we're good to go. So as you can see, really not a terribly difficult project that knock out the construction in a weekend, and then the following week, do all the finish work, and there in two weeks, you've got a nice box mantle for above your fireplace, maybe above the headboard of your bed, or maybe above the, uh, the couch in the living room. I've seen these advertised online for anywhere between $600 to $1,100. And let me tell you, I have maybe about $90 in cherry wood invested in this project, and of course a few extra bucks for the finished materials but you can't put a price on the satisfaction of doing it yourself. This is certainly a project that a beginner do-it-yourselfer could knock out, but you do need to have the right tools. I highly recommend having a small contractor grade table saw and a nice miter saw. Everything else is kind of gravy on top of that. With the right tools, a little bit of time, and some patience, you too can get some spectacular results. So why don't you give a box man like this a try? I know you can knock it out. But if you have any questions or any comments to this project, please leave them in the comments and I'll get right back to you. And of course, I'm always looking for new subscribers. And if you haven't seen it already, I'm doing a giveaway as I march towards a thousand subscribers. Please check out my book triangle video, which gives you all the details on my giveaway. And I'm giving away one of those book triangles, which also works great for an iPad or a tablet stand. So check out that video too, and I hope to see you as a subscriber. Until next time, folks, best of luck on all your projects, and I look forward to seeing you right back here on Do and Brew. Take care, folks.